Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Rob Silverman, and I'm excited to share with you the father of functional medicine, Dr. Jeffrey Bland. Uh, Dr. Bland, I mean, you need no introduction. Just, <laughs> I mean, like, there's so many things we can say. Um, I just want to, like, tip the hat and say thank you for coming. Thank you for continuing and sharing great insights. I mean, we were just having a conversation before, and uh, again, you never cease to amaze. You never cease to motivate me. And I, I'm already was taking notes and I know there's so many things I wanna to get to. Um, I see everybody coming up. I just wanna tell everybody, Dr. Bland will be answering questions. So please, if you have a question, put it in and look at that. I ask and I will receive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a nice message. Thanks so much. This is exciting. Really fun to be with you, Robin. Uh, you know, as was said to me by Linus Pauling, you're, now this is decades ago when I had the privilege of working uh, for him in the early 80s, uh, he said, you know, you always measure uh, a teacher by the quality of their students because you hope as a teacher your students will be better than you. So um, that's exactly what I think of you and, and many of your colleagues who are taking this to the next level. And, and you know, just um, for me, in the, and now four decades that I've been involved with this field, uh, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing leaders such as yourself who are really creating the impact on so many others to then create the impact on patients globally. So we can really start to push back against this rising tr tide of chronic illness. Yeah, and I, thank you very much for those kind words. And I speak for everybody. Thank you. The, you know, they say the student becomes understanding of what he needs when the teacher's there and you have been without question to teach for so many. And when I told everybody that you were coming on, everybody just said they're gonna take time out of their day to hear what you have to say. So let's just dig in, let's go for it. Good, please. Inflammation, immunity, those are two things at the top of everybody's consciousness. Uh, the role of chronic inflammation and its effect on immune health. That's well, I think the first, can I, can I just say a quick word, and, and this may be, I don't want to um, insult anyone's intelligence here when I, I say this, but I've become very, um, what do I say, informed over the last uh, couple of years that for many individuals, individuals who are really very knowledgeable about uh, healthcare, functional medicine, integrated medicine, and so forth, that they don't understand that the source of all inflammation comes through um, a variety of different uh, processes that are associated with the immune system, that inflammation is a phenotypic outcome of one aspect of our immune system that's uh, uh, fighting against what it feels is foreign invaders and, uh, and or a system that has in, been injured. And so when we think inflammation, we are thinking one of the phenotypic principles or uh, observables of the immune system. And I I, I find it interesting that some people think like the immune system is separate from inflammation. No, they're they're directly connected by processes together. Great inlay. You know, um, there's more than a thousand clinical studies showing the typical Western diet destroying health. My mantra is to manage and modulate inflammation. You're saying there is a balance between inflammation and immunity, or as we've had this discussion before, Immunity is the backbone or the balance of your immune system is the backbone for inflammation. So would it be fair to say that um, everybody's a little pre-inflamed right now? Yes, I, I think that this, again, uh, to, to dig a little bit deeper into, the, into what's emerging to be the story, is that our body has this extraordinary uh, adept ability to sample information from the outside and inside world. And we're being, uh, all of us, being exposed to information all the time. And that information comes through our senses and through receptors that pick up um, the molecular configurations of things like what we eat or like what we breathe or like what we drink. And so those, those molecules that are present within our dietary digested materials are present in the air that we breathe in polluted environments, there are mechanisms that are receptors on the surface of our immune cells that start in our lungs and start in our gut that pick up that information from those molecules and translate that into the body through these signal processes, these what are called signal transduction processes that are mediated through the immune system. Therefore, there are only really three ways that our body is 24-7, 365 sampling 
the outside and inside world, telling our rest of our cells in our body how to work. And those are the immune system, the nervous system, and the uh, pulmonary system, uh, which uh, the pulmonary mucosa, all of which then intercommunicate to tell our body how it should respond to the inside and outside world, such as the microbiome, such as the air we breathe, such as the food we eat. And those systems are uniquely identified by that person's own response. There are, these are individually owned. So there's no two individuals that have the exact same response to the inside and outside world through this system that the immune system is the principal responder. And by the way, our immune system, which is made up of all these different kinds of cells, we call them the white blood cell systems, um, many different uh, members of that, of that system with different names, uh, T and B lymphocytes and the macrophages, neutrophils, dendritic cells, T helpers, regulatory, all these different uh, cells, that all of those together comprise this network of communication cells that turn over and are replaced about every oh, two months, meaning the immune cells in our body two months from now will be different than the immune cells that we have today. So the question that we ask is, are they then the ones that we'll have two months from now the same then as the ones we have today? Are they different than the ones we have today, meaning they're either more responsive to the environment, reactive, producing more inflammation, or are they less reactive, meaning more balanced? And that's where the story becomes very interesting because we're learning how to modulate that immune system so that we can make it better than it was rather than more reactive than it was as we move forward. And that is the process of immunorejuvenation. Wow, you've got some real salient points there. Number one, essentially you talked about uh, three ways that the body communicates. So the body works by intercommunication. It's, it's one communicating system. Then we talked about a little bit of triggers and barriers. So I like to break it down as there's triggers, triggers that can damage barriers, and then we want to have communication. But the real point is you get a new immune system every two months, you said that. We've had COVID for 24 months, so I could have 12 new immune systems. That said, what have I done for my immune system lately? That's it. You hit it right on the nail on the head. So we, we have this concept of, oh, my word, we just got the immune system we have, and there's nothing we can do about it. We're just kind of the outcome of either good or bad fortune. And uh, woe is us if we have a bad immune system. And I think what we're learning now is the dynamics of the immune system is much greater and its plasticity and ability to become resilient is much greater than we previously understood. But we have to, just as we would train a muscle, we have to train our immune system to be that which we want it to be. We can't just take the luck of the draw. We have to intervene in our immune system just as we do a fitness program for our cardiovascular fitness or our musculoskeletal fitness. We need, an, we need a training program for our immune system as well. Well, you gave it to me. You were, we're going to just go right in. You said that you can train your immune system. You said like you could rejuvenate your immune system. So one of the things that you've talked about, you know, you're making it, if you will, the coin of the realm. One of the phrases you use so well is immunorejuvenation. So people, could you define and differentiate immune balance, immune support, immune rejuvenation for immune resilience and vitality? Exactly right. And, you know, we've had enough experience now with, with this concept that uh, people who have had years of, of hypersensitivity to certain environmental allergens or people who are sensitive to certain foods or people who feel like they're in a state of chronic uh, gastrointestinal inflammation with uh, chronic irritable bowel syndrome, uh, that when they get onto the right program that's designed around immune fitness, and I want to emphasize fitness just like we would say cardiovascular fitness or musculoskeletal fitness, we can do immune fitness, that we're on that when they're on that program and they're then turning on the processes that are already inherent in our body's ability to rejuvenate our immune system, they can roll back then and say, you know, I'm not so intolerant to foods as I used to be. Gee whiz, I'm not so responsive allergically to my environment. Gee whiz, I don't seem to get everything that comes around like I used to uh, every cold season. Those are the, are the processes of rejuvenating the immune system, not just boosting the immune system. Well, 
I think you've said the idea of boosting the immune system is an issue because it could be, it has to be balanced. So now you're boosting the seesaw up, but it's still unleveled and that's part of the problem. And you're talking about immune rejuvenation, the ability for these immune cells to uh, be rejuvenated. I think the key aspect, and I know you're gonna wanna piggyback on this is intermittent fasting, uh, autophagy and mitophagy, you know, our body's own ability. So that really goes and speaks to what you're talking about with a new strong immune system. Yeah, these are highfalutin terms, aren't they? When we talk about autophagy or mitophagy, uh, it's like, oh, gee, you know, that can, uh, people's eyes can glaze over very quickly. The, the, the point I, I really want to make before we start giving a little bit of demythologizing those terms and making them more accessible is that all of this that we're discussing now would be considered in the parlance of science, new science. The Nobel Prize uh, of Medicine and Physiology was, uh, was won for the discovery of the process of autophagy just within the last 10 years. So this, this, these concepts that we're describing about rejuvenating the immune system <clears throat> have not been around for a long time. So when people might say, well, I've never heard about this, that's probably not surprising unless you're kind of a geek and following the latest uh, kind of science and trying to understand how it translates into, uh, into human health applications. But what we're really talking about are the discovery of biological processes that are within our genes that are there to help our body to respond to the uncertainties of a changing environment. And those processes help to get rid of damaged cells. Uh, they help to rejuvenate or restore healthy cells. They, they are there to re-nourish processes that have been undernourished if they are given the right opportunities to do so. And that has to do with what we're discovering many times in a person's lifestyle, the way they eat, think, move, uh, breathe, uh, uh, how their behavior is in the world, how they see themselves. All these signals, all these things I've just described are within the range of, of tools that a person in properly designed programs can implement to teach their immune system how to be more, reju uh, more resilient and to rejuvenate itself. So autophagy, I think it was 2016, uh, yeah. won a Nobel Prize, the breakdown of a cell, the debris they use to make a new enriched cell. It's kind of like breaking down a raisin to get a new grape. It's amazing what people, and it's a huge takeaway. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bland is telling you that you can improve yourself. Aging is not just, it doesn't mean you're gonna degenerate. You can regenerate certain things. So it's never too late to make an improvement in your health. Now, with that idea of immunorejuvenation, that's quite exciting. Um, but I'd love you to explain something called immune identity, the personality of our immune system. Kind of, you know, the way you've described it, it's our personality, but it's our status. Thank you. Yes. You know, for a long period of time, uh, again, people just thought of their immune system as being there to defend against viruses and bacteria or organisms that might create infection. And certainly the immune system does do that. Uh, that is one of its purposes is to help defend us uh, against uh, foreign invaders of, of microbes. And it also has this ability to remember what it's exposed to so it can mobilize response if it gets exposed later. Uh, that's our immune memory effect, the so-called adaptive, uh, adaptive immune system. But the immune system also does more than that. Uh, the immune system is also involved with cellular uh, regeneration. It's involved with cellular repair. Um, and so it has multiple for, uh, uh, pro processes it's involved with, including, as I mentioned earlier, communication with the nervous system. So the nervous and immune system are intimately involved. It also is interrelated with the hormonal system of the body. That would be like uh, estrogen and testosterone and cortisol, the blood sugar stress hormone. Um, so it has interrelationships as a signaling tool that helps to uh, put the body in a state of defense to its environment, basically. Now, with that in mind, we say, okay, then how does that relate to the cellular renew renewal, the autophagy process? And how does that relate to getting the most out of the genes that make up our immune system so they become more resilient. And that has to do with getting rid of some of the cells that are damaged. These are the cells that have what is called the inflammatory 
um, capability of just producing this uh, pot boiling chronic inflammation state that many people are in for decades, uh, a state where they are not so inflamed that they are uh, thinking they're suffering from a severe um, in inflammatory injury, but just a chronic state of inflammation that their body, it's called inflammaging. It's associated with the acceleration of biological aging. And it turns out that one of the cell types in our body that is most susceptible to this inflammaging and this inflammatory type happens to be our immune system. Mm -hmm. And so as our immune system is in this state of injury, and that is what it's called aging of the immune system or immunosenescence. And by mm -hmm. the way, the aging of your immune system doesn't necessarily have to track directly with your age and birthdays. You can have an age of immune system that's much older than your age and birthdays, or you can have an immune system whose age is less than your age and birthdays. And for most of us, we'd like to have our age of our immune system to be at or less than that of our age and birthdays, because that means it's going to be more resilient and more capable of defending us, and it will not be in an immune state of chronic inflammation. So there are these various immuno identities that we carry, each one of us. It could be an immune type that's infl inflamed. It, can, it could be an immune type that's suppressed. It can be an immune type that's allergic. We carry these individual characteristics that we would say, oh, I tend to be more of this immuno type. And we have been studying this kind of classification of immunotypes. The objective is for us to have a balanced immune system. No matter what your imbalanced immune type is, we want to bring it back into balance, which is the resilient state, and that is done by immunorejuvenation. So well, first, let's identify what the immune state is, the immuno identity. Second, let's then look at how it got to be that state uh, as a consequence of your lifestyle, your environment, your diet, and so forth. And then third, let's find a program to pull it back into balance so you have a more resilient immune state that is balanced. I got a couple of questions. I get some questions on my uh, phone here. I get them up there. So question number one is, how would you test for your immune identity, Dr. Bland? So the uh, rapid advance in the technology of immune assessment is uh, one of the major frontiers of new science. It's, it's rapidly advancing. And many of these uh, techniques, um, these what are called cell cytology, where you actually measure the personality of each immune cell in your body or, or a group of them, is um, being done by new cell counting technologies called uh, flow cytometry. Uh, this is not like a standard technology that's used in um, practice of medicine in general. It's more of a research technology, but there are now uh, new laboratories that are starting to engage in flow cytometry analysis and that will give specific types of immune identities based upon the types of immune cells that you have floating around in, in, in your white blood cell milieu. Um, in the absence of that technology, because we're still seeing uh, the, the evolution of this field, there are certain kinds of characteristic signs and symptoms that a person presents that tells us, at least informs us, as to what the state of their immune system is, what immune identity state they would be. It's not obviously as specific as a diagnosis that would be done by flow cytometry, but it is at least indicative of the kinds of immune structural changes that you might have for which we can then develop a more personalized approach to manage that condition. So I, it starts with, with kind of question and answers. Um, what we have a, an immuno identity questionnaire that we use to kind of interrogate the immunotypes, the immuno identities, and then from that uh, move into a more informed discussion of what does that immuno identity mean in terms of your particular health issues. And where can you get that immune identity? That's on bigboldhealth.com? Uh, yeah, uh, bigboldhealth.com. You can do a, a self-scoring on our immuno identity questionnaire and, and kind of get a, a, at least a first-level understanding of what, uh, what, what one of the immunotypes or immuno identities you might fall into. And you have an associated article that I read last night again. It's on Mind Body Green from 2020. If anybody wants any information, just Google Dr. Jeffrey Bland. Uh, immune personality to you know, come up. So I want to start digging into some of the solutions. People always want to hear what is the answer. And, and we know that what the problem is, Americans are unhealthy. Their diet is awful. 60% of their calories come from sugar. Americans consume 142 pounds of sugar per year, uh, excuse me, about 160 
it's 146 of wheat. So between the two, they almost consume a pound a day. I mean, honestly, how deleterious is that? In addition, artificial sweeteners, 142 pounds. So everybody's full of sugar, gluten. We'll throw dairy in there, toxins. So I wrote the question down. What would you do to reduce strategy and improve your immune system just starting with diet? And then we'll get to supplements, lifestyle, and the like. Thank you. So I'm going to say the obvious. So this might seem so trivial that everyone would say, well, yeah, that's a duh. But sometimes it does are really enlightening if we think of them a little more deeply. So my first level is to say, we want to get the stuff out of the diet that's been shown to cause the immune system to think that uh, a foreigner is on board, that there's some something that is uh, amiss, that there is something that is not compatible with the healthy function of the body. So we wanna get rid of those things that the, the immune system of that individual is responding to as if it was foreigner or it was a dangerous substance. And you mentioned a couple of them there, um, excessive sugar being one. Uh, so that I'm gonna go, go through a little more detail in a second, but let's talk about the second phase. So you wanna get those things out. So what do you wanna put back in? You wanna put back in those things that have been demonstrated to actually help support these processes of getting rid of immune cells that are senescent, immune cells that are injured, immune cells that are carrying bad messages, immune cells that are in a state of chronic inflammation. And that's the process of, uh, as we mentioned, autophagy, mitophagy, and epigenetic remodeling of the immune system. Those processes are being explored by immunologists around the, right, around the world right now, huge numbers of publications coming out in that area. And so what we have learned, duh, is that there are things within our diet that help to support that process. Some of those we know very well, like vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, and certain, certain nutrients are very commonly understood. But now there is the recognition that there are a whole collection of other substances, many of which are removed by food processing, that are called phytochemicals or phytonutrients that are rich in you know, vegetable plants of different families that actually are there to serve the role to modulate these uh, processes re related to immune cell renewal, immune rejuvenation, particularly the flavonoid and polyphenol families and specific members within it. So you think of epigallocatic and gallate um, from green tea, or you think uh, about um, uh, quercetin uh, from onions, onions and uh, and a variety of apples, for instance, or you think about um, curcumin uh, from turmeric. All of these are known to have uh, influences on the cellular processes associated with selective immune autophagy and renewal of the immune system. These are new processes that are just being discovered at a mechanistic level that we did not know about until the last uh, 10 or less years that can be um, mobilized and utilized in putting back into our diet things that will uh, help renew our immune system as we take out of our diet things that are putting the immune system on edge and causing chronic inflammation. So it's a balance of those two factors that leads to immune renewal. Outstanding. So obviously sugar is a bad guy. We know that 300 calories of sugar in a two-hour period decreases your immune system by 50%. Gluten, bad guy, dairy, bad guy. But I, I think what you're, tr what you're saying, and I'm going to try and captivate all that you said in a sentence, food is inf information. Bad food can be inflammation. Choose wisely. Yes, and I think that uh, one of the things that uh, you and I have learned uh, over the years in, in looking at how people respond to their diet is there is no one food that we can say is is perfectly immune, uh, well tolerated by every human being. There's a lot more biological variability in how our immune system sees our food than we previously recognized. And so there is not like the perfect diet <laughs> that every human being can be on that same diet and it will uh, cause their immune system or create an immune system that's uh, optimally, optimally balanced. Now there are certain principles that we know, and you mentioned a couple of them, that are generally uh, applicable to everybody. But I, I, I'm very cautious about saying this is the diet that e every human sh should be on with eating these foods to create the optimal function of their immune system because there is this biological variability, this biochemical individuality, as Roger Williams termed it, 
uh, that we need to be aware of. But we can certainly dial in 80% of the way by certain dietary principles of getting the bad stuff out and putting the good stuff in. That's that's where we would want to start. Well, you know, um, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. You were nice enough, and you're not going to get it from Dr. Bland. I worked hard for this. I got a free bag of Himalayan tartary buckwheat. And my wife is a great cook. She's a great chef. She did a great job. And I have to tell you, you know, it's a flour loaded with over 100 immune active ingredients, plant-based I would really like you to tell the story because I think everybody needs to know. So people say, okay, um, I know what I shouldn't eat, but what should I eat and how do I prepare it? And these are one of the backbones of a foundation of food for us. Yeah, thank you. So it's very interesting. Um, there are over 20,000 vegetables that have been eaten by humans over time. So they're edible plants. Of those 20,000, 20 or less provide 70% of the calories for humans on earth today. Now, what are in those other plants <laughs> that we're not including in the diets of individuals? Um, the rice, wheat, corn, you know, soy, which are the principal things that people consume, products from those. Um, and what you find in those other of the 20,000 edible plants is a rich array of extraordinary immune active nutrients that were built through the genetics of that plant over millennia to help defend that plant against their environments. Because remember, plants can't run away. They are sitting there, they're, they're sessile. They're, they're organisms that are stuck to the ground and therefore, if mold or uh, bugs or whatever comes to them, they have to have ways of defending because they can't run away and they can't go to the pharmacy and, and find drugs. So they have developed very adept immune systems to defend themselves in their own environment from these things that would cause injury and, and uh, illness of the plant. Well, it turns out that those plant immune active nutrients are members of the phytochemical family. And the reason that we have so many different phytochemicals, so the ones that are found in cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage, those are called glucosinolates. They have a different effect on immune function than the ones that are polyphenols found as, as uh, catechins in uh, green tea. Uh, because the tea plant was, uh, senescence, was um, exposed historically to a different set of microbes and a different set of infectious organisms. So it developed its own immune system with its own immune protective chemicals versus the, uh, uh, the cabbage or the broccoli plant. And so what we find is that the immune system of plants are connected to the immune system of humans through the secondary chemicals that they make. And when you start looking at the immune strength in the plants, you want to go to plants that have grown up in really hostile environments, like uh, where they had to really fight hard against bad weather, against bad soils, against the... Uh, uh, low water against uh, toxic materials like aluminum in the soil, like a lot of bugs in the environment. And so you go to those places in the world where people have lived, and what do you find? Um, you find that, lo and behold, many of them are in what uh, uh, Dan Buettner called the blue zones. The people lived in blue zones in very hostile environments in which the plants that they were eating were plants that had to grow up uh, and evolve to defend themselves against those hostile environments. Now, one of those uh, environments happens to be the Himalayan mountain range region in uh, northern China. And if you go back and look at what people have eaten uh, from those regions, you can actually go back 4,000 years. 4,000 years, and you find out that they were eating a very interesting cultivar, a very interesting uh, plant, that had um, extraordinarily high levels of these immune protective nutrients that's called Himalayan tartary buckwheat. And it, it, it turns out this plant has been consumed, as I said, for over 4,000 years. It actually um, migrated with um, uh, kind of people coming back and forth uh, from uh, Asia into Europe, into Eastern Europe, and it became a major uh, food product uh, in the, uh, in the 15th and 16th century in, in Europe, this uh, Himalayan tartary buckwheat. And then it was ultimately uh, actually brought over on the original 
ships coming into uh, the Americas as uh, foods that our colonial ancestors raised because it was so hardy. It didn't need her fertilizer, pesticides. Uh, it, it grew in bad soils. And um, it was a major food stru stuff in the United States. It turns out about 200 years ago, however, in the United States, this, this crop was lost. People start, stopped growing it. And I think the reason for it is because it's so high in these immune uh, protective phytochemicals. In fact, it's between 50 and 100 times higher than any other plant food that we, we know. So it's not percent, I'm talking about times higher. Um, because it's so high in these phytochemicals, it has its own taste profile. And as our taste profile in America went more and more towards white sugar, fat, and salt, mm -hmm. this kind of product became, because it has a high flavor profile, people started saying it was, well, it didn't fit into the sweet, fat, salt kind of environment, so we, we lost it. Mm -hmm. Well, we kind of refound this uh, a, a few years ago. We found one farmer who was an ex-Cornell ag scientist uh, who was growing it in upstate New York on a small little uh, kind of hobby farm. And we became very interested in it and started to really uh, develop a cooperative of other organic farmers to start growing it with us. Uh, I never thought I'd be involved with organic farming, and, but now we're in, engaged in farming and, and with a milling operation to actually produce for the first time organically uh, produced and certified Himalayan organic, uh, uh, Himalayan uh, or, um, tartary buckwheat flour. So this is a very, very interesting kind of chapter of how the immune system of plants speaks to the immune system of humans because the portfolio of phytochemicals as you said, uh, over 100 different phytochemicals in Himalayan tartary buckwheat have all been shown through a lot of science over the last uh, 20 years to have direct influence on these process of immune cell renewal that we're talking about, of autophagy, mitophagy, and recreation of uh, rejuvenated immune systems. So here is just one example of going back, and it's like back to the future, relearning old things in new ways, and then recognizing that nature has a big story to tell us if we just open our minds to it because there's all sorts of things in these 20,000 plants that we have yet to learn that could be beneficial to our immune system. Outstanding. So again, let me give you some of the specs on it to uh, summarize everything. Uh, Dr. Bland did a great job, plant-based immune benefit, polyphenols, proteins, prebiotics, antioxidants. It is a resistant starch. So guys, even though you see calories, the resistant starch goes through the small intestine, gets to the large intestine, and it's fiber. Um, and it's a soluble fiber. It's grain-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, all the things that when you come in here, I tell you, do not consume while it's also 100% organic. It's got a very unique phytonutrient, holbumin, which is, is in all my upcoming articles because it has such a positive effect on immune function. So I got about eight people texting me, probably saw me playing with my phone. They're saying, where do I get it? I'm like, there's a link. And what I was able to do, everybody who wants to procure something that we talk about can get a 10% discount. It's in the link above. Um, a good friend of mine, she, uh, she and I are chiropractic classmates, a very elegant, brilliant young lady. She said she was willing to try this. How does it heat cooking with this buckwheat affect the activity of the phytochemicals? Well, Val, Dr. Val, Mamie cooked it. It cooks really great. We've used a little allulose. We've used a little stevia. Obviously, don't cook with monk fruit. Um, and Dr. Bland, do you want to address the uh, activity of the phytochemicals? Yeah, that's a very good question. It turns out there, there is um, quite a bit of work that's been done in the culinary area with uh, tartary buckwheat, looking at the impact of different uh, cooking methods and different preparation methods and even different milling uh, technologies. And it turns out that uh, if you heat uh, uh, tartary buckwheat in a cooking process, it actually liberates more of the, uh, of the quercetin, which is one of the high level of the um, phytochemicals along with rutin and, and uh, luteolin and, uh, and uh, decarinositol. These are all uh, interesting phytochemicals that are found uh, in the tartary buckwheat um, symphony of, of uh, phytochemicals. But actually, uh, heat, heat treatment actually does liberate it and, uh, and makes uh, these even more available for absorption. I'm just going to kick in that uh, there's a couple of great articles, uh, recipes, and uh, great chia seed pancake. So, you know, everybody says, Rob just said carbohydrates are the devil. I didn't say that. 
but it's not a carbohydrate because it's a resistant starch. Now, um, we talked a little bit about the foods and some people are asking, what about the supplements? And, you know, if I were to dream up a supplement to have things that would be necessary for inflammation and immune function, I would have thought of something. I'm taking your credit, of course. Prorisabi media is omega-3 fatty acids, natural reoccurring vitamin A, vitamin D, and the hidden antioxidant astaxanthin. So, I mean, everybody would like to hear why Prorisabi media is, why omega-3s. Yeah, so let me let me uh, just finish up if I can quickly with the uh, Himalayan tartary buckwheat story as it relates to uh, this inflammation connection. Um, what we've come to recognize is that this inflammatory phenotype or this inflammatory immune type um, is responsive to the uh, extraordinary array of phytochemicals that are present in tartary buckwheat. That's one of the reasons that we're very excited about it, and I think it's one of the reasons our farmers are very excited about growing it because here they have a value-added crop that uh, really has some uh, some differenting a differentiation in its health benefits. So I, I think that we we start we start to recognize that this portfolio of phytochemicals that are present in tardy buckwheat has a unique personality as it relates to our immune system, and that's why we uh, we finally recognize that not everybody is a baker, not everybody is going to use the flour. So we then actually then uh, made a concentrate of those uh, most active phytochemicals that we put in a product called HTP Rejuvenate, which is a, a capsule of uh, a concentrated form of these phytochemicals. That makes it a little bit more convenient for people who are not gonna use a flower every day in, in their regime. So that's, that's just a, a kind of a tip as to one of the ways to get these phytochemicals in a more convenient uh, form. Uh, secondly, with regard to the story of omega-3 fatty acids, uh, for me, this is part of a, a, a a long voyage in my professional life. I, I, I look back and in, uh, in 1985, actually, I was involved with um, speaking to the first uh, omega-3 supplement that was sold in the United States. It was uh, Max Epa. And um, I, I was asked to be one of the original investigators of Max Epa and do clinical work. And, and I was um, on a number of TV shows like the Today Show uh, back in the, in the middle 80s, uh, really talking about this. And if you think of that, uh, going back to the 80s, uh, the dominant theme back then was fat is is bad and we should have no fat in the diet. And, no. and um, so it was really speaking against what was being told to us at that time. It was being told to us, cut all the fat out of your diet because it's dangerous. And here I am, I'm going on the media saying, but there's some fats that are good that have these omega-3 oils because look at the Greenland Eskimos and look at their cardiovascular, low incidence of, of cardiovascular disease, eating almost all fat in their diet from, from blubber and, and, and seals. And um, that, that concept then over since 85 has grown up as we now know to be much more well understood and, and the fact that we have this good fat uh, component of the omega-3 oils as precursors for downstream uh, immune modulators that uh, have very uh, important roles in, in uh, regulating inflammation and immune system function. What has been found since then, however, by uh, Professor Sirhan uh, at Harvard was a major next step because he found that these omega-3 fats, particularly DHA and EPA, were influenced, uh, were actually metabolized in certain ways by our immune system cells into a second class of substances that are called pro-resolving or specialized pro-resolving mediators. And these SPMs, specialized pro-resolving mediators, are those substances that actually quench the latter stages of inflammation. As our body goes through a process of recovery, it's been injured or it's healing, it has to finally shut off inflammation and, and, and go back to normal immune vigilance. And it's, it's done by the orchestration through these pro-resolving mediators, these PRMs. And it turns out that there are certain oils uh, that are not highly processed that have higher levels of these uh, pro-resolving meteors than other oils. If you highly process a marine oil, uh, you're going to end up with very significant um, uh, removal of these pro-resolving mediator substances. In, in uh, naturally occurring oils that have been minimally processed, you can have reasonably high levels of those. And that led me uh, into a collaboration with a a friend uh, who is an Alaskan uh, uh, fishing uh, uh, boat, uh, actually company owner, uh, to develop a, a, 
uh, technology uh, that we actually have a plant in Dutch Harbor, Alaska in the Aleutian Islands to uh, minimally process uh, oils coming from uh, Alaskan line fed sustainable uh, uh, cotton and salmon into uh, oils finally that have undergone, avoided all the kind of chemical processing that most omega-3 oils undergo to produce a, a product that has very high levels of these, uh, these pro-resolving mediators in it. So it, it's an oil that has high levels of vitamin D, uh, reasonable levels of vitamin A, high levels of uh, EPA and DHA, and high levels of PRM. So it's, it's really this immune-centric oil, and we call it Dutch Harbor Omega or DHO Omega. And it, it's a, it, it's a complement we feel to our uh, uh, Himalayan tartary buckwheat that they tend to go together as part of an immuno rejuvenation uh, program. Pro resolving mediators, they excite me. There's a couple of things that I've got to, without question, add. One, so everybody knows, a pro resolving mediator, a specialized pro resolving mediator, allow for the resolution of inflammation. Dr. Bland said, like a boiling pot, like I cook. You're simmering, inflammation is set a fire. This is a specific nutrient that allows for the resolution in the homostasis of inflammation. Please don't think that inflammation getting turned on is bad. It's what's bad is when it gets turned on too high, it goes too long. Pro resolving media is allow for this. Now, with the combination of omega 3s, they're very synergistic. Dr. Bland's being very kind, he's not telling you the quality of where they're getting it from in very deep water where it's line caught versus net caught. And in that line catching, they're able to flash freeze it and really hold over 90% of the nutrients. This is an avant-garde way of um, isolating these particular oils. So when you look at what's in the bottle, the label in the bottle, you're getting almost 100%. In many of the formulas that we have to use, unfortunately, the process isn't as pristine. So a couple of people have asked me, like, where are you sourcing it? Where are you getting it? Um, I know you said it, but I think they really need to know the quality of and the ratios of what you're doing. Someone just asked the EPA DHA ratio, and it's really it's PRM to EPA to DHA and everybody there's DPA in there. And I know they're going to want you to tell everybody about the elongation of DHA to go to DPA. So let's just quickly review why I got so excited about this. Um, <clears throat> I got excited because one of our family hobbies is boating up in Alaska during the summer. We live in Seattle, so it's um, about a thousand miles from here uh, up into the southeast Alaskan waters. And uh, we have spent quite a bit of time up there over the years. And, and I happened to meet um, the owner of uh, this fishing company, um, Clipper Seafoods. And I was very impressed with his boats um, it, because his boats looked very different than any of the other boats that I'd seen up there fishing. And I got in a conversation with him and he said, yes, that the way these boats were designed, he turns out he was a, a marine architect uh, before he became an owner of a fishing company. And he said the way that, um, that these boats were built is that the uh, fish are caught on hook and line. Uh, they're brought into the boat uh, as a live fish, one fish at a time. All the people on the, sh the boat are inside, nobody's on the deck. Uh, they come in uh, and they go immediately into a cleaning station, whereas a live fish, uh, the, the, uh, the fish is then dressed and the oil producing part of the fish then goes directly into a, uh, on, onto a flat tray, which gets frozen within about uh, 20 minutes from a live fish at minus uh, 15 degrees. So it completely captures um, the, any of these labile heat sensitive ingredients are because of this flash freezing on board are not lost. And it turns out that when I started to know more about this, it's the only place in the world where this is done. It requires number one, Alaskan waters that allow no fish farming. And it's a sustainable fish farmed resource, uh, as, as, excuse me, as a sustainable fish catch with no fish farming and Alaska, um, also is a place where we have the lowest level of contaminants uh, in terms of PCBs and others. And lastly, these boats are the only boats of their type that can provide that kind of line to frozen on board in 20 minutes that then is transported to our shoreside facility as frozen 
And then through our process, it never gets above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, we're able to extract out those natural ingredients without uh, degradation. So that's why, why we end up, actually, uh, for me, it was such a surprise because when we finally got this plant built, by the way, it's the only pharmaceutical grade oil extraction plant in all of, um, South, all of Alaska, we were able to, uh, the first batch that came out of that plant um, was colorless, odorless, and tasteless oil. <clears throat> it had never been processed. And the reason for it is that those off taste and off colors come from degradation. So if you prevent your material from being degraded, you don't have to put it through all the kind of processing, distillation, and, and uh, you know, kind of winterizing and uh, saponification, all the things that are done to make dirty oil into clean oil that then loses a lot of their nutrition value. Excellent. A, a slew of questions. Are you okay with questions? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Ask, I know you're busy and I know you, the time is pressing. I don't want to keep you longer, but Valerie's got a great question. Um, should SBMs be taken in addition or can they be taken in place of other EPA supplements? I think you're going to tell her that you got it all in one. In the yeah, and I, they all should come together because they're all part of the same process of the body's uh, feeding the immune system what it needs for rejuvenation. So it's, it, it, it should come together. So we've got Neil Carcusa, an old friend of both of ours, lipid mediator class switching pro-inflammatory to pro-resolving. We're going to give him absolutely kudos. She just came on. So they're suggesting, I think she's asking the product names, which they can get at the link on the top and get a 10% off. Yeah, um, and I, I think you asked, a, you asked a very good question about in terms of the ratio of the oils. You know, the, the oil composition of these fish, these fatty fish, is not just random. Uh, they select the oil composition <laughs> that are necessary to support their body's function. And one of those body's functions is the immune system of, of that animal. Uh, remember, uh, that's a pretty hostile environment down there in the briny dark. Uh, lots of predators and, and, and agents that can make a fish ill and they get injured and they have to repair themselves. And so the, uh, the ratio that we find in, in these fish oils that I've been mentioning can vary slightly depending upon the, uh, the species of fish that you're, you're deriving the oil from. In terms of uh, deep water, um, uh, Alaskan cod, it's about 50-50 EPA, DHA, um, and it's about 15% uh, DPA uh, of the omega-3 family. And omega-3s represent somewhere around 30% of the total content of the oil uh, with uh, reasonable levels of vitamin D, about uh, uh, 50 IUs of vitamin D per cc, and uh, about um, uh, 1,200 IUs of vitamin A equivalent uh, with about 100 to 150 micrograms uh, per gram of uh, the pro-resolving meat eater. So it's a really interesting ratio of those, of those nutrients. It's really defined by, by the fish, the environment it lives. And by the way, it's interesting to note, these omega-3 fatty acids, you, uh, we don't think of them as vegetable nutrients, but you recall that they are not made by the fish itself. They, uh, the fish eats plants, phytoplankton, which uh, uh, ultimately, the, actually they ate the zooplankton, which ate the phytoplankton through the food chain, but it's the plants in the ocean that make omega-3 oils. And so really omega-3 oils are vegetarian in their origin, and then they get processed through the fish into its body oils. So it's, it's kind of an interesting process that you think about that they're, they're, not, a, they're not actually making those omega-3 DPA and EPA uh, DHA and EPA, they're actually consuming it as part of their food chain from the plants in the ocean that, that uh, ultimately uh, were the, the uh, synthesizers of those omega-3 oils. Great story. And it really, I, I, I felt that great takeaway. It's you are, you know, we used to say you are what you eat, but you really you are what your food ate, what was exposed to the environment. It was grown, swam in, the soil and everything. And what you're talking about is the most pristine conditions if you really want to imbue the immune system with efficiency, because look where they are in the coldest of water at the bottom. And, you know, when you look at it, it's sockeye salmon with cod liver. And I think you told me that the cod liver itself is like 20% of the total weight. And, you know, we all know liver is an immune cell. And, um, 
uh, as you said, it's got naturally occurring vitamin A, vitamin D, and astaxanthin. For those people who don't know astaxanthin, it's a critical antioxidant. It's better than virtually any other antioxidant. It would be held in the highest of esteem, sitting on the dais with L-glutathione. A lot of people are asking a ton of questions. They're really good. Um, do you re recommend a loading phase for acute injury? So your your formulations, would you recommend an acute phase or would it be straight across? Yes, I, I think there is a difference between a therapeutic dose and a, and a maintenance or prophylactic dose. So um, often the some of the, the studies that have been done in a, a more inflammatory states is to get up in the in the range of something like 10 grams a day of omega-3 PRM rich oils, which to get that practically, you really need to take it as a liquid because that would be probably 10 capsules of one gram capsules a day, which is more than most people would take. So we do supply our, our oil in liquid form as well because a teaspoon is about six grams. So you can more conveniently administer. And by the way, uh, uh, people often think of taking oils by mouth as really ghastly tasting. And I think people will be amazed at how clean these oils are and how neutral they taste. Uh, uh, people who have said, oh, I would never take a fish oil orally, it's just too fishy, are saying, oh, I don't, I don't have that fishy taste. And the fishy taste is often a consequence of the breakdown uh, products of the oil through oxidation and so forth and the production of peroxides and aldehydes that make these fishy off tastes. Oh, wow. We'll blow it up. I, you, they're never going to let you go out breakfast, brunch, lunch, whatever. Um, Asher Allen, I know you know who he is. Why, why wild Alaskan sockeye versus smash fish for your SARS? Well, it turns out that we can uh, source Alaskan salmon as um, meeting the criteria of sustainability. And, uh, and there is, I, some of you may know, um, the Marine Stewardship MSC certification, which is, uh, we are certified by MSC, has somewhat been tainted a little bit reasonably uh, recently because it seems like it's a, maybe a little bit of a pay, pay to play type certification. The state of Alaska has a higher level of certification that not just certifies that the fish is from a sustainable source, but that the communities in which the fish are caught, uh, the people, the fishermen, the, the surfside um, processors, the whole community are sustainable. So you have to have a, a, a system that relates to sustainability. You're treating people properly, you're treating the land properly, you're treating the fish properly. And that, uh, that standard is a standard that we are meeting uh, because of the way that we're catching the fish and our, our salmon come through that process. So we've tried to go to the highest authority to make sure that we're fulfilling the criteria of sustainability, both in communities in Alaska, we even you know, at our plant are hiring uh, and training uh, Alaskan natives, uh, um, individuals to be part of our process so that we really can uh, embed our culture into this, this whole native Alaskan spirit of preserving salmon and preserving fish. Fascinating. You know, for me, the versatility and the durability of the formulation is critical because we can use it as a standard just to help people every day. You know, you're getting your pro-resolving mediators, your omega-3 fatty acids. Great for immune boosting brain. I mean, we should really talk about the beauty of the pro-resolving mediators in that they help the function of the central nervous system and the blood-brain barrier. What's better for synaptic uh, plasticity in the brain than omega-3 fatty acids? So a lot of people are asking, what would you use it for? It's really the um, elite Swiss army knife of health as a formula. Then one question is, do you, you know, they asked, and, and I'm going to help you with this one. They said, would you take it in place of food? No, I mean, uh, you've told me a hundred times. That's why they call them supplements, supplemental to lifestyle and food. So I want to ask you a question because um, I know everybody wants to see and hear the vision. It's 2022. It's February 8th. Where are we going health-wise? Where do we yeah, need to thank, go? Thank you. And, and I, I'm... Uh, I'm on board with you on this. We've had these conversations offline. Um, this uh, experience that we've just gone through as a global culture the last two years with SARS-CoV-2 is the agent of, of change that uh, I think is a wake-up call. Um, some people call this a syndemic. That's the term that I'm seeing in the medical literature that a syndemic is the combination of 
two things going on or more simultaneously that synergistically creates this global epidemic. So what are, what's been going on? Well, first of all, I think we've learned that we had a chronic epidemic globally of altered immune function upon which we then layered a viral infection called SARS-CoV-2. And when you put those two things together, it's, it's, it's a bad outcome. And so we see a lot of people who got infected with SARS-CoV-2 who went on as a end of life experience. Mm -hmm. And other people who got infected with the same vector um, had a fairly mild course and resolved and went about their way. Same vector, but extraordinarily different outcomes. And the outcomes were related to the functional resilience of their immune system. And their functional resilience of the immune system, what we've learned globally, particularly, let's focus on the United States, was far less um, capable of, of mobilizing reserve than we thought. We were in a state of compromised immunological imbalance as a culture. And so as I look forward, I think that what we're seeing is that we have a lot of work ahead, both culturally uh, and in our medical world, to do all we can to get people's immune systems put back together, to culturally rejuvenate our immune function. Because if we don't, this isn't the last uh, virus that we're gonna be exposed to. We are exposed to thousands of new chemicals. Our food supply has been degraded. Our, our climate is changing. Um, and if we don't find some ways of improving the interconnection of the immune systems between people, plants, microbes, and the planet, to harmonize them, to improve resilience, we are all in uh, a, a negative spiral. It's not just climate change in and of itself, it's the degradation of people's immune systems. We all need to see that we, we, uh, we have the ability, each one of us, to be part of the solution by first working on our own immune resilience because that will then have us eat plants that have good immune resilience, which then makes the dependence on our soil architecture and our soil microbes more healthy, which makes our planet more healthy, which creates an immune stability across all systems. So we can vote by how we act on our own immune systems to make a contribution to global stability of immunity. And I think that's what we're learning going forward from 22 on. So we got uh, Dr. Stark, good friend of mine, wicked smart. Uh, thank you for discussing health immune culture. We got a lot of comments. Some of them wanted you as the man on TV to discuss what to do during the pandemic. Um, he is available and you have been, you know, um, I'm going to let out a little secret. You have a bunch, I mean, a, a bunch of videos in March and April of 2020 talking about immune. It wasn't like you're talking about it now. You know, um, my friend would say, if you're just talking about it now, you may be playing the results. If you do it in March and April, you may have the vision, which I've used that word, you're a visionary. And I, and I mean that wholeheartedly and I thank you. And I think that everybody who listened and everybody who's going to listen is really going to be enthusiastic that there is an answer. We need to start taking care of ourselves, whatever side of the fence we are. And the biggest problem is that we, we don't hear enough and we do not take care of our immune system. And that is without question our defense mechanism for life. So in a nutshell, guys, there's three barriers to the immune system. You got your skin, you got your gut, you got your innate, and you got your adaptive. And your kids will have an adaptive acquired because they'll get it through life. And antibodies are something that catalog what's going on. So last question before we let you go. Give them three things that you talked about today that you want them to do, Dr. Bland, because they are ready. They got their pens in hands and they're ready to go. Three easy steps to boost their immune system. Yeah, I, I think uh, step one is to recognize that we can be the master of our immune system, that we're not the victim. We can be the active participant in training our immune system to be more our friend. So that, that's number one. It's just the aha that we're just not like waiting passively for our immune system to tell us how it's gonna function. Number two is all the things that we've been learning, that you've been teaching, that we have been advocating for decades about lifestyle, diet, environment, 
are all now able to be mobilized to enhance those processes of immune cell renewal and to personalize programs by using those things that we now have learned with new science can actually regenerate immune system function. And third, I believe that we have recognized for the first time that we can fall into different immuno types or immuno identities and that our objective is to take those immuno identities, whether it's an allergic type or a suppressed immune type or an inflammatory immune type um, or an autoimmune immune type, and we can find routes to take those immune types and move them back to immune balance. And that's what we at Big Bold Health are really focusing on. That's why health professionals, I think, can value by going to our pro.bigboldhealth.com website where we have all these this information material that uh, you, you talked about, Ram. And that's our advocacy as I go forward now. Uh, that's my full-on uh, commitment to do all we can to try to, to spread this news and, and get it out so people can really make it part of their lives. I think this surmises it best. Take home message by Dr. Work. He says, actively participate in the immune system. You guys need anything? There's a link at the top. It's there. Dr. Blanders here, uh, Big Bold Health. I can't tell you how much I... I'm really honored. You know, when I first saw you, I was like, wow, this guy's larger than life. And you are tall, but <laughs> you're larger than life. And to be able just to ask you questions and and feel, uh, you know, sh to get the information out to, to trying to elicit you to be able to you elucidate these comments. It's just so exciting. And I'm so compelled that uh, I just got a text. He's He's not as good as he was before. He's better. <laughs> well, that's very kind. I think the, um, I, I, I hopefully well, I've got a few miles left on the tread. You know, my wife has said, when are you going to retire? And I said, actually, I have retired. I'm retiring, putting new tread in the tire so I can roll a few more miles. So that's my retirement. That's awesome. Father of functional medicine, everybody. Dr. Jeffrey Grant, thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions, I'll try and answer them after. Dr. Bland, once again, thank you. Keep going. We need at least another 50 years of you. Rob, thanks so much. It's such a privilege to, to have you as a friend and colleague and, and be part of this community. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you.